This is a GIS News Hour for Wednesday, March 23rd, 2011. I am Abigail McIntyre. In the headlines, new law could soon come into force addressing the sale of alcohol to minors. British government's decision on APD described as small but important victory for the Caribbean. And preserving the jobs of workers remains a major priority for TUC. Details to these and other stories are next. and saving the world in style. Join the Indian Cultural Organization of Grenada Inc. at the Mon Rouge Park Grand Dance in front of KFC on Saturday, March 26, in celebration of Pagwa Holly, the Festival of Colors. Celebration starts at 5 p.m. until 10.30 p.m. Chutney dancers and singers from Trinidad, local artists Steve Giudo, song Changing and Saving the World in Style, Tangla, a group from St. Mark's for Indian Drum and Dantel, local dancers performing a spring dance to welcome the beginning of the spring season, Tassa group children entertainment and many more surprises. Admission free, lots of Indian food on sale. Do you really want to save on the cost of posting? Grenada Postal Corporation is the answer. We offer convenience, online tracking, reliability, on-time delivery, and of course, unbeatable prices on express parcels and registered mailing. Ask about your online visa application and notification by email service. Grenada Postal Corporation, a member of the UPU, the world's oldest network. Send, receive, delivered. Welcome back. A new law may soon come into force that will address the sale of alcohol to minors and it may even increase the age range for doing so. The Drug Control Secretariat in the Ministry of Education is developing an anti-drug strategy. The five-year plan will outline in detail how government organizations and institutions will implement stringent drug control measures. The Secretariat has proposed, among other things, that the strategy changes the current legal age for purchasing alcohol from 16 to 18. Grenada is not the only country going through this process, but other OAS member territories in the Caribbean. So far, the strategy is about 65% complete. Head of the Drug Control Secretariat, Dave Alexander, says the strategy will affect each citizen and changes will have to be made. There are things that the, the police would have to do, the customs, um, there are things that the media would be involved in, um, there are things that the business places, for example, would have to look at because one of the things that would be um, coming in in the new strategy is the revision of the liquor license um, laws. The laws that deal with the sale of alcohol, in particular, the sale of alcohol to minors. Mm -hmm. Now, in our legislation, uh, the, 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 the age at which the legal age for purchase is age 16. Well, we have proposed, we have already proposed, not will propose, but we have already proposed to government that that age be raised from 16 to 18. Okay. So, um, not sure what will happen, but this is the proposal that we have made and we are pushing. And so, should that come about in legislation, then the business places would have to be aware of that. We are also asking that if a person comes to your business establishment to purchase uh, an alcoholic drink, and you're not certain of the age, you find they look young, but they're not too sure, you can ask them to produce their ID photo ID which would have your photo and of course your date of birth. If they cannot produce that, then by law you are restricted in terms of selling it to that person. So there are some changes coming in that area. We are also proposing in law now 
that the sale of alcoholic beverages be uh, uh, be deemed as an offense at any school function. We already have that in terms of policy, okay. but we are now moving it from policy into law. Mr. Alexander says the strategy will ultimately lead to the further development of the people and country of Grenada. The strategy is coming to benefit our people. It's not just to, to target anybody and to, to cut seals or whatever, but okay. it's for the overall development of the country. And we, ha we have to bear in, that in mind, because uh, when we have persons being um, experiencing medical problems, experiencing legal problems, etc., because of the consumption of drugs, it affects the nation, because the nation has to pay. Yeah. As a government, as a country, we have to pay. And so we're seeking ways how we can uh, alleviate those problems um, from occurring and uh, developing. So the strategy is there to benefit us in Grenada and, of course, by extension, the region. Alexander says public participation in this process is critical to the success of the strategy. Sending your, your suggestions. Um, we've had some excellent suggestions from a number of persons in the public. Um, for example, in raising the age from 16 to 18. This came from the general public. A number of meetings we had over the last year or so, and, pe and persons raised those concerns. So we want to encourage the public to continue to support us in this regard, to continue sending in your suggestions, your comments, and um, they would help us in this area. This strategy is it's a lot of work. It's not just sitting down and putting some on paper, but there's a, a, meth, uh, a formula that you use, a methodology that you use to come up with this thing. And we have to bear in mind that we are looking into the future. We're looking five years ahead where we want Grenada to be. And so, um, you know, as I said, we, we're pleased with the kind of support, the kind of assistance that we're getting um, from the public and the OAS, as I said. Uh, we'll be meeting in Trinidad in the next couple of weeks mm -hmm. to do some final touches to this thing. And so uh, we look forward to that, um, that happening. Mr. Alexander will lead a team to Trinidad in a few weeks to meet with four other regional territories. To fine-tune the strategy, tie loose ends and incorporate suggestions given by citizens. A final draft will then be sent to Cabinet for approval, then tabled in Parliament. A small but important victory for the Caribbean. That is how tourism officials in the region are describing the decision by the British government not to increase its air passenger duty this year as previously projected. The decision means that the burden will not be increased on British travelers to the Caribbean. Tourism Minister the Honorable Peter David says the proposed increase was discriminatory and that there was insufficient consultation with the Caribbean. The increases would have slapped on an extra 40 pounds on tickets for people traveling to the region. We've been saying it in the Caribbean for some time that the way in which the, the, the tax was going to be implemented was going to be discriminatory to the Caribbean. Uh, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the way it is planned, uh, you know, cities as far away as California are treated as being closer to cities like St. George's, which is absolutely ridiculous. So we pointed out the the discriminatory nature of the tax. We, uh, through the Prime Minister of Grenada and all of the other Prime Ministers of the region, we sent letters to the British government, and that went to, to governments before this present government in Britain. It was the, 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 the Gordon Brown administration. And we are quite happy that the administration, the, the current administration in Britain, uh, has agreed to to, 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 to look at it again, to at least suspend its application, at least for a year, to have more discussion, because we were concerned that there was insufficient consultation with the region uh, in its application, because we anticipated that it was going to have a serious impact on tourism. It was going to increase tickets by a, 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 a minimum 40 pound per ticket, which is a substantial amount of money for many people traveling across from Britain. Britain is one of our main uh, sources, uh, Europe in general, one of our main sources of, of tourism, uh, of, of, of tourists. And we were very, very worried that the application of the tax and the resultant increase in the airfare from Europe to Grenada would have resulted in a decline 
in tourism in the upcoming season. We were already informed by persons in the cruise industry that that tax was going to reduce the amount of tourists who flew over to the region to do cruises, and we were well aware that it was going to also affect the overnight stay in Grenada. So we are extremely happy, and I know the other governments in the region will be expressing that concern. A statement has already been issued by the Caribbean Tourism Organization that they are very happy that the British government has decided to suspend and engage in more consultations in the proper application of such a tax. Within the one year delay, Minister David says the Caribbean tourism ministers will hold a number of discussions and negotiations with the British government on the matter. He says they will ensure at the end of the day whatever is decided upon by Britain will not negatively impact the tourism industry. Our view is that over the next year, we will be having intense discussions and continue to have discussions with the British government on the application of the tax. We have an old relationship with Britain, and we believe that with the removal, removal of, of, of the, uh, the, 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 the subsidies and the removal of support in the banana industry and the other agri in the agricultural sector, that Britain and the European countries should be more sensitive to our developmental needs. Um, we believe, quite frankly, that uh, the British should be supportive of our, 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 our attempts to ensure that tourism becomes a main developmental uh, industry and therefore should not do anything that will negatively impact on our tourism. And we are going to be working with them. We understand that they have their own uh, domestic needs, but we are going to be working with them to, to ensure that whatever tax comes, whatever application method that they use, does not negatively impact on the tourism industry. And we believe that we can find a way to do it. And the signal that is sent now that they are listening to us is certainly a good indication to us that the negotiations over the next year can lead to a much more equitable, uh, equitably applied tax and a tax that does not lead to the serious decline in the tourism industry that we anticipated this one would. Minister for Tourism, Honorable Peter David. Meanwhile, the chairman of the Caribbean Tourism Organization, Ricky Scarrett, says this development is clear evidence that the British government is listening to their concerns. He says in spite of the good news from the UK Chancellor, their advocacy on the APD is not over. Scarrett added that all Caribbean tourism interests must continue to fight for APD reform in a manner that further removes any competitive disadvantage and does not hamper their efforts to achieve sustainable growth in tourism. The preservation of jobs of workers in Grenada and other TUC-affiliated countries will be foremost in the minds of union leaders when they meet for the Triennial Congress here on Saturday. TUC President Mrs. Madonna Harford says that these are extremely challenging times for governments, unions and workers. She says the unions and the ILO have been singing the same song for the past few years. Workers' jobs must be preserved to avoid deeper problems. The Congress, which begins at 10 a.m. at the PWU headquarters, Quarters will be addressed by Trinidad and Tobago's Labour Minister Errol MacLeod. So coming out of this convention, you would see the need, I'm sure all the delegates will be telling you, we have to make sure at this time, this year, the next three years, that we ensure that workers' jobs will be protected. And that is what will, will come from, from, the, from the Congress. Another thing I see coming from the Congress is ways and means of having to um, maybe stabilize the economy, ways and means of having to, the, the cost of living, if you could find ways and means of maybe putting a cap to quite a lot of things. Because if you leave things like that, it means to say it could get out of hand and then you have more problems, you have more persons complaining and um, the cost of living when persons have large families. It's a, it's a, it's a real sad situation, not only in Grenada, but throughout, throughout the world. Mrs. Halford says they will continue to champion the call for more social dialogue, a national health insurance, a public transportation system, and a consumer agency. On the issue of the removal of income tax from severance pay, the TUC president says while there is more that can be done to make them happy, they are pleased that the government has moved this up until December 31st, 2012.
We still would need that thing to go because what we have discovered is that Grenada is one of the few countries in the world with income tax on severance pay. Most of the OECS countries, you get your severance package because remember, with severance package, you are out of a job. You're putting you out of a work. Mm -hmm. And um, it might not be the 20-year-old one who Has going time. home, yeah. Eh? Yeah. who would have a lot of time and opportunities to look for new employment. It might be those with 15. my age yeah. or your yeah. age. Right. And um, at that age, what really would you do? So you have to see your severance package as my final lump sum. <laughs> my final lump sum in the workplace. So how could you want to take income tax on that? Um, pension is not a taxable item. So we have to see severance in that light. So we would want government to remove it completely. Saturday's meeting comes at a time when the OECS is still reeling from the collapse of both BICO and CLICO. According to Mrs. Harford, Grenadians have suffered even more than other Caribbean citizens because they almost lost their life savings in SGL Holdings and Capital Bank. She says regulation is necessary and suggested that the Caribbean take a page from Canada's book because of its regulations to protect consumers and financial institutions. So we have to start to look to see what they did that we could really um, take a page from the book. Because if you have these sort of institutions operating without any regulation, it means to say when, when, when they collapse, you have thousands and thousands of persons who would not get one cent more than what your pensions are affected there are some persons who are waiting for the pension they are in their 50s their early 60s waiting to go home and what are we going to do so at age 60 i am going without anything in my hand so regulation is key and we have to make sure that governments, OECS governments, Caribbean governments, put regulation in place to make sure that that sort of thing would never, ever happen in the region again. The Public Workers' Union has a medical plan for employees, scholarship programs for children of members who have passed common entrance and now is looking at children of members who have entered a team Marishu Community College. At least three students entering TAM CC are given scholarships every year. Labour representative in the Senate, Chester Humphrey, is concerned that there may be a structural inherent deficiency within the public service. This was voiced when he supported the school's rehabilitation project phase one loan authorization bill in Senate on Tuesday. Senator Humphrey says there is a need for more information in some of the documentation presented before the Senate. One of the concerns of some senators was the unavailability of a list of schools that will benefit from the tent. 10.5 million U.S. dollars that the Minister of Finance is seeking authorization to borrow from the OPEC Fund for International Development. Some public officer has to prepare the documentation to come before the Senate and to, out of Parliament. And it is either they are unaware of what Parliament requires, and here I will urge the clerk to get involved, um, and when these things come to us, send it back to the respective department and say, but this is deficient in terms of the information which the Senate must debate or speak on. I, 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 I will put out a quiet challenge, but I'm not certain that anyone on the government side knows which schools and so on are to be refurbished. So they can't even play politics with it. Senator Prime, I'm certain, can't announce in Karaku. Well, I get in three schools, and this is what I've done. You know, so this deficiency, it's not a deficiency of this current administration or a deficiency of the last administration. It's a structurally inherent deficiency within the service because I've been here through several different administrations and the same problem keep reoccurring and reoccurring. And I think this is where the, the, the clerk's office must come in. If I'm going to transit information to be discussed by the parliament, then Parliament must, it must meet a certain minimum standard of inf information that Parliament can intelligently discuss these matters. And here again, I want to urge uh, the government's, uh, the leader of government's business 
Um, and I don't, I don't want you to take up the challenge. Um, at least my um, suggestions might be accurate. Uh, or if you do have the list of schools, and you could be so kind as to graciously give it to us, of course, we will appreciate that. But I think the difficulty is systemic, and um, the way to correct it is the way that I am suggesting. Farmers' Representative Keith Clowden also gave his support to the bill, saying education is a fundamental prerequisite for the development of any society and the alleviation of rural poverty. But given the amount of money to be borrowed, he also thinks the list of the schools to be rehabilitated should have been made available to them. Madam President, when these bills like this one come before us, it would be far more productive if they give more details and in so doing we would be in a better position to debate these bills because for example I really don't know which schools are involved what is the extent of rehabilitation whether the money how much money actually would be going to the school feeding program sorry um, how much funds from this 10.2 million dollars well under institutional support and consultancy services and capacity building and institutional strengthening, there might be some overlap in there. I don't know. But this is what, what I'm saying, Madam President. If there's need to have more details so that we can engage in a far more productive way when debating these bills. I when Finance Minister Nisenberg moved the second reading of the bill during a meeting of the House earlier this month, he identified a number of schools. These included St. Mary's RC, McDonald College, St. Joseph's Convent St. George's, the Presentation Brothers College, the Grenada Boys Secondary School, the T. Marishu Community College, and Woburn Methodist. Barbados is on a mission to promote its products in the OECS and its campaign has brought representatives of several companies to Grenada. A trade mission is currently being undertaken by the Barbados Investment and Development Corporation, facilitating a visit of as many as 20 participants. The March 23rd to 25th undertaken has the support of the foreign trade ministries of both countries. While here, representatives of the BIDC and the BMA will meet with various ministries, trade development organizations, chambers of commerce, and will conduct market research to further assist Barbadian manufacturers. The mission theme is connecting with the world through trade. The objectives will be to identify sources for raw materials, explore opportunities for trade, conduct product sampling, renew and form new trade linkages, and also to roll out a newly developed BIDC export brand. In other news, the Ministry of Agriculture is expecting a shipment of banana tissue to take the industry forward with large-scale production. Hundreds of banana tissue are coming from Israel and France and is due to arrive here in June, July this year. As it stands now, Grenada is importing bananas from St. Vincent and Suriname, something that is costing government thousands of dollars. But the Ministry wants to change this by engaging a particular group of farmers in large-scale production. These farmers will be provided with all the necessary equipment and assistance needed to get the job done. Minister for Agriculture, Honorable Michael Lett, says his ministry is collaborating with the Marketing and National Importing Board on the project and is hoping to see the benefits of this by year end. There was a meeting between the Marketing and National Importing Board, the Ministry of Agriculture, and the farmers who are interested in replanting the banana industry. And the decision was taken that we'll be able to supply them with different things such as sleeves, the plastic for sleeving the bananas, the twine, because you know it's quality banana we are looking at for ripening. And in order to get quality banana, proper field sanitation must be taken must take place by sleeving the bananas the floor in the bananas, propping it so that in case of heavy winds, the bananas will not fall. So we are working closely with the Marketing and National Importing Board and some of the farmers who are willing to go on a large scale to produce farmers, to produce bananas. So that I guess by the end of the year, 
we should be able to see some marked improvements in the production of bananas in Grenada. Chief Agricultural Officer Daniel Lewis says it's important and necessary that the materials are brought in from international countries so as to minimize any incidents of contamination. No longer could we just take ordinary planting materials from Grenada and plant because one of the main diseases that affect banana, the banana subsector, is a disease called moco disease and it's spread by contaminated planting material, contaminated tools, so we have to be very, very careful. If you are to move plants from one area, a uh, contaminated area, into a clean area, you'd find that it would contaminate the whole island. So we have to take the very expensive step of importing planting material, very expensive. Even when the plants get here, you have to have the, 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 um, the facility, the infrastructure. You have to move substantial amount of soil, you have to have all the potting bags, so it's a little um, costly. And so very soon, we sincerely hope that by um, by June, we'd have planting material to distribute to farmers and so forth. The ministry will also provide what's called plant protection. It involves ensuring the plants are free from pests and diseases. This is an expensive procedure and the ministry is bearing the cost. As you know, to produce high quality bananas and planting and so forth, you need to take care of all the pests and diseases. The ministry have um, a spraying program where we have a team of people who go out and assist farmers in that regard. And it's quite expensive, but the ministry is incurring that cost. So it tells that highlights, I think, the commitment on the part of the ministry to support um, the banana subsector. In addition to that, um, one of the main programs we hope to institute should to banana and planting farmers is the question of training. And in that regard, a training program would, would commence shortly because there's always the need to provide that kind of support. You're watching the GIS News Hour. We'll be right back after the break. is the second annual Peter Phillips Schools Drum Corps competition in collaboration with Maximalt, Friday, April 1st, at the National Stadium, starting at 2 in the afternoon. Ten secondary schools will be vying to take the title from the 2010 champs, St. Andrew's Anglican Secondary School. Be there to witness Carrier Cook Combine, Presentation Brothers College, the Anglican High School, McDonald College, Mocha Secondary, Westerhall Secondary, the Grenada Boys Secondary School, Happy Hill Secondary, St. John's Christian Secondary School, put on their best display to be crowned 2011 champs. Admission $5 without uniform, $3 with uniform. It's the second Peter Phillips Schools Drum Corps competition at the National Stadium, Friday, April 1st, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Come support your school and drink a Maxi Mold. Start your morning with the Government Information Service. Tune in to GIS Spice Morning, Mondays through Fridays, starting 6.45 a.m. Spice up and brighten your morning with an informative television show with guests from a broad cross-section of society. You too can be a part of our Spice Morning. Call us at 440-2061 or email gisgrenada at yahoo.com. GIS TV Channel 12, your best choice for educational and entertaining television. Welcome back. Commissioner of Police James Clarkson has reaffirmed his confidence in members of his force. He says Grenada remains one of the safest countries in the Caribbean, with much of the credit being given to police officers who perform their duties to the best of their abilities. As of now, these officers, this police force, this country, are one of the safest in the Caribbean, one of the safest in the region. And the only how this could be so is because of the professionalism of the officers, you know, because the um, interaction with the community. And as long as we can get the community to work with us and the com um, police the, the, the environment, 
then this will be so for a long while because this is the only police force in the region that works this way with the, with the, the, the people in the country. Commissioner Clarkson's comments were made Wednesday in the latest in a series of island-wide inspections of divisions of the Royal Grenada Police Force. Wednesday's visit was to the St. John's Police Station. The inspections have several objectives. According to the Commissioner, they include gaining a first-hand understanding of the working conditions at police stations and reminding officers of their roles and of the RGPF's rules and regulations. These inspections that are taking place right now it's just a question of, it's one of the, the means we use to discipline our people in the good turnout. We look at the living conditions, um, working conditions, and how they deport themselves generally, and give them a little um, beef up, so to speak, you know, encouragement to do their work, even though with little resources, but continue doing the work with the community. Mr. Clarkson, whose first set of visits was to the RGPS Eastern Division, commended police for giving their utmost in often very difficult physical working conditions. I did the Eastern Division and today we start in with the Western Division. Right? Um, the, so far they're, they're doing the best they can in terms of keeping the, the areas um, livable under the present conditions. You know, some of our buildings are very dilapidated and there's not much we can do about that. Um, we keep pushing and as I said, I, I, feel, I feel a lot for officers in those conditions, you know, and um, it's a work with the community that is pulling us through. Commissioner of Police James Clarkson. The importance of reforming Grenada's constitution continues to engage the minds of people in different sectors of society. The point man behind the review is Professor Simeon McIntosh, who met with members of the Conference of Churches this week. Mr. Robert Branch of the Ministry of Legal Affairs says it is important that there is transparency at all times. The government has decided that in the best interest of making this transparent and that there is a truly genuine and national conversation on this issue, that the process should be non-partisan, non-political. And so the Attorney General is charged with guiding the process forward with Professor McIntosh as a lead consultant. And I am the, the focal point within the Ministry of Legal Affairs for constitutional reform. And we will give advice on the process forward. Professor McIntosh is the lead consultant on Grenada's draft constitution review and explains the reasons for a review of Grenada's constitution. What we are engaged in is one, rethinking our constitution, our constitutional and political practices. That is to say the kinds of practices that would have been informed by the constitution that we now have. No, that's number one. We engage in a, a thorough rethinking of that constitution and in the process, therefore, of hopefully of rewriting that constitution and ultimately doing something that we never had the opportunity to do as a sovereign people, that is to enact our own constitution into law. Because in a democratic society, the people is the legislating body, is the people is the legislating body, not the parliament. The parliament is a creature of the constitution. In other words, the parliament is, some, is an institution that the people would have, have created for their governance, but the, the parliament is not the sovereign power. Uh, so in essence, therefore, this politics that we are engaged in is one essentially where we are, what we are doing something that the Americans had done uh, over 200 years ago. We are literally refounding our constitution, which we've never had the opportunity to do, having regard to the fact that the independence constitution that we have had been written and legislated and handed for us by the British imperial power. 
A June targeted date is set to start national consultation. Copies of Grenada's constitution and the draft that is being discussed are available at the Government of Grenada's website at gov.gd in government documents on the legislation. The fundamental right of freedom of conscience and religion was addressed with church representatives this week. All other faiths, whether it is ours, others, or the non-believer, we must recognize that, that they too must find the equal presence. And therefore, if we really look genuinely at the language of the current preamble, we would see that it's the language which recognizes the partnership of the state and the church, particularly the Anglican church, in uh, colonialism and slavery. In essence, what we, have, what we know is that Many, in, well, separate and apart from Britain with its Church of England and Church of Scotland, many of the states in the region would in fact have accorded that kind of preeminence to the Anglican Church. It was only in 1969, as I understand it, that, that Barbados would have disendowed the, the Anglican Church because Barbados had virtually had the Anglican Church, the Church of the State. But to have a Church of the State is thereby to demean by implication, to give that kind of political imprimatur to, the, to one church is to, give, is to demean by implication the equal presence of the others. And so because Christianity makes such strong claims to religious truths and revelation, that we must therefore recognize that what we are saying sometimes could in fact be, especially if it's stated in our political documents, could in fact be demeaning to others. In keeping with this year's Arbitetium Leaders theme, Water Beyond the Surface, Sustaining Life, Securing a Future, the St. Joseph's Convent Granville has devised a local theme, Water, a Kit for of Survival, and Water, a Way of Life. They have embarked on a number of projects and activities in recognition of World Water Day, which is observed on Tuesday. Public Relations Officer to the group Shadell Stafford and President Shanta Hofford highlighted some of the projects and activities planned for the period. One of our main projects we have planned is a forum mm -hmm. for the Mount Camel Marquis Fish um, Marquis area with the claim of untreated water which they get through the taps and the second one we have will be on 25th of March we will be engaged in a march around the town of Grenville which is aimed at sensitizing the public about the activities and different aspects we have planned. Mm -hmm. And additionally after the march we will be carrying out a survey in the communities of Marquis and Mount Camel in order to investigate that um, the claim that the water that is served to the people is untreated and with that information if it is true then we'll take that information to Namasa in order for them to correct that problem. Among other activities is a forum with fishermen at the Grenville Fisheries Office on April 1st in conjunction with the Fisheries Division of the Ministry of Agriculture on the concept of wastewater, particularly ballast water. Recognizing that invasive species can enter our waters through ballast water and affect industries such as the fishing industry, the group of young students sees it as important to educate fishermen on how their livelihood can be affected by these invasive species. And we came up with some questions which we made a questionnaire mm -hmm. and with the help of some of our teachers we made a powerpoint which is aimed at sensitizing the public the fishermen especially about the water the ballast water and the lionfish mm -hmm. to tell them how the impending danger about the lionfish and the ballast water how it could the lionfish could be transported by that means so on the 1st of April, we'll be having the forum with the um, fishermen and we hope to tell them about the impending danger about the water and the lionfish, which was recently discovered in our neighboring territories, Dominic and St. Kitts. Mm -hmm. 
Meanwhile, the junior achievers groups of SGC Grenville are well on their way with their company called the Tropical Explosions. The objective of the group is to get Grenadians to eat healthy and locally with confectionery products that range from cornmeal cookies to spice biscuits. The students gave an insight to some of the projects that they have planned for a six-month period. They also say that project support has been great thus far. We are manufacturing products using local materials to get persons to eat what they grow and grow what they eat and with that we also have a tropical explosion queen show where persons will um, showcase their talents. It has been going, been going well. Mm -hmm. Sales have been going really great. We, are being, we get a lot of customers because we have unique products and um, we get a lot of support from people inside the school and outside the school, so it's been going great. Students from the Caribbean and other regions outside the European Union will find it much tougher to study in the UK under new measures announced by Britain. Under the plans which will be phased in from next month, individuals will need to provide even more proof that they are coming to the UK to study rather than work and must show they have the financial means to support themselves. Home Secretary Theresa May said the measures were, um, were aimed at rooting out abuse of the system. But the shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper accused the government of trying to meet tough immigration targets by going after the economically valuable foreign students market. Former President of the Caribbean Association of Industry and Commerce, Nigel John, is calling for improved standards and productivity levels if CARICOM is to benefit from the Economic Partnership Agreement, the EPA, with Europe. Mr. John is also advocating for registration of professionals in Grenada in order for them to meet one of the criteria of the EPA. The EPA was signed between CARIFORM countries and the EU in 2008. That's going to do it for news. Sports is next with Trevor Thwaites. Stay with us. The Ministry of Labor wishes to advise persons who have applied for the seasonal agricultural farm workers program of a meeting to be held at the Seamen and Waterfront Workers Union building on the Carinage on Friday, March 25th at 10 o'clock in the morning. The Eastern Caribbean Liaison Service will be visiting Grenada to provide an orientation for one day only, Friday, March 25th at 10 o'clock in the morning. There'll be video presentations highlighting life on the Canadian farms. Please make every effort to attend and be on time. A message from the Ministry of Labour. It's where the action is each and every Tuesday evening from 8pm. Join sports enthusiasts, those who play, organise and follow the game as they discuss the issues that matter most in sports. Relive the action of sports and give your views. So let's make a beat. Sports Forum on GIS TV each and every Tuesday from 8pm. Pakistan reached the semi-finals of the ICC Cricket World Cup with a crushing win over the West Indies. Wesley College draws first blood in the 2011 United Insurance Secondary Schools Cricket Tournament and several young players call up to the national soccer team for the two upcoming friendlies against St. Kitts. Hello, I'm Trevor Thwaites and this is another of the GIS Sports. We start with cricket and uh, the region is shocked and embarrassed uh, by what has been a hapless performance by the West Indies, which saw them being crushed by Pakistan in the first quarterfinal game in the ICC Cricket World Cup. Regional pride and commitment were missing as the regional team was overwhelmed by 10 wickets as Pakistan moved into the semi-finals. Mohammed Hasif, uh, Shahid Afridi and Said Ajmal took two wickets each in and over to bowl out the West Indies for a mere 112 in 45.4 overs. Shahid Afridi, the captain, claimed 4 for 30, to take his tally of wickets to 21, the most in the comp competition. 
Only Shiv Narayan Chandra Paul resisted with an unbeaten 44. Sawan scored 24. West Indies, who lost their last four wickets for three runs in an 18 run loss to England, did even worse against Pakistan as uh, 5 to 8 went for just two runs. It was a most lethargic and dismal showing from skipper Darren Sami and his men. Pakistan then raced the victory, reaching 113 for no loss in 20.5 overs, with the man of the match, Hasif, striking an unbeaten 61 with 10 fours, and Kamal Akman, an undefeated 47, firing 7 fours. They will meet, that's Pakistan, will meet in Thursday's game. They would meet the game between, the winner of the game between Australia and England and uh, India. Meantime, a gripping contest is in the making as Australia face India in the second quarterfinal game on Thursday. The teams are hot favourites for the championship and their meeting promises much thrill and excitement. The likes of Tendulkar, Dhoni, Yuvrat Singh, Virat Kohli, Habajan Singh and Zai Khan are leading the fight for India, while skipper Ricky Ponting, Shane Watson, Brad Haddon, Michael Clark, Brett Lee and Shane, uh, Sean Tate are in the forefront for Australia. Pundits are saying that the game has the, has the making of a mega clash. Well, it is a mega clash. <laughs> On the local scene, Wesley College has drawn first blood in the 2011 United Insurance Secondary Schools cricket competition. The River Road outfit beat Princeton Brothers College PBC by 77 runs in their clash on Tuesday at Woburn at the Woburn Plain Field in St. George's. It was only it was the only game possible on the opening day, which was badly affected by rain. Derek Thomas, 31, and Jeff Heather Bernard, 22, helped Wesley College to a respectable 154 all out in 24 overs. Andrew Etienne from the Jealous Mountains bagged 3 for 17 and Joshua Young 3 for 29. Presentation Brothers College in reply was bundled out for 77 in 21 overs. Jonathan Holder hit the top score of 22 while Derek Thomas grabbed 3 wickets for 17 runs. 18 schools are competing in the 21st edition of the competition. The St. Andrews and Lincoln Secondary School SAS are the defending champions. Still with cricket, St. George's beat St. Andrew by 17 runs in the Independence Women's 2020 competition last week Sunday in Woburn. Rachel Cyrus, 36 not out, and Anisha Thomas, 30, batted well to help St. George's to 139 for 3 in their allotment. St. Andrew, in reply, was dismissed for 122 in 18.3 overs, with West Indies player Afi Fletcher scoring 36. There were two wickets apiece for another West Indies player, Debbie Ann Lewis, Cyrus, and Helen Hunter. The event continues on Sunday with two matches at the Mark Monk playing field in St. David. St. Andrew and St. David meet in the opening game from 10 o'clock in the morning, while St. George and St. Patrick clash in the other four hours later from 2 o'clock in the afternoon. In football, Several young players have been drafted into the national training squad as the country gets ready for the Gold Cup in the United States. They are part of a 24-man contingent, getting ready for two more matches against St. Kitts Nevis. Reports indicate that the team is training diligently for the upcoming matches with daily sessions which began two weeks ago. Among the young youngsters featuring prominently are midfielders Moran Phillip and Raquel Augustine from Kaip Hurricanes and Chevron Chevron Sampson from St. John's Sports. Other talented newcomers are striker Denron Daniel from Hard Rock and defender Irvin Smith from Queen's Park Rangers. Coach Mike Adams says that the young players are bringing plenty of drive and passion to the camp. We now need, after this competition, to be ushering the next generation. And that is why we've made a deliberate decision of working with our under 20s and under 23s in the camp today. It's brought an energy to the camp which has been much needed. The coaching staff have been focused, they've been excellent and players and coaches alike are turning up to the sessions with drive and with passion. And that's my job to achieve that. And today I can only commend my staff and commend the playing staff for delivering on that 100%. Football coach Mike Adams. Uh, the GFA says that English-based professional defender Cyrus 
uh, David Cyrus, who played in the 2010 Digital Caribbean Cup, and newcomer striker Daniel Facey, brother of uh, Delroy Facey, who also played in the last Digital Caribbean Cup, will feature in the matches. The first game is in Bastyr, St. Kitts, on Sunday, March 26, with a return fixture at the National Stadium in St. George's, uh, April 2nd, that's Saturday, April the 2nd. After sharing the Winter Island Secondary School Games in 2009 and losing it to St. Vincent and Grenadines last year, Grenada is making a concerted effort to regain the title in 2011. Football and volleyball setbacks have caused the country jelly, and efforts have been made to address this. Earlier than usual, training for the two disciplines are taking place this year in an attempt to give the country the cutting edge. Football coach Alex Adibala says that training will start this weekend for football. In the past, we were fortunate that um, the national youth team would have been training and that would have been a plus. That has not happened in recent time and we think it's one of the things that has led to us um, coming second in the last two years. Uh, so we are making early preparation. In fact, we attempted to start last weekend, didn't materialize and we are going at it again this weekend. So probably officially we'll be starting the, the secondary school training this weekend and hopefully we'll take it from there as to what will happen there. On. Some 22 players will be involved in the training. We are going to start with uh, 20 or 22 players to start the training and, uh, and as time goes, we're also hoping that somewhere along the line we get some little competition that we could fit the team in. And that's why we are starting the preparation so early. You're going for the kill this time? Well, yeah, it's time. Um, um, two years we have not won. That, that is sort of unusual in the secondary school football for, for Grenada. So, and we also think that when football wins, it's one of the sports that help the, the competition to go in overall in our favor. And so last year we didn't win, and hopefully this year we will. Football coach Alistair DeBellett, uh, volleyball coach Raphael Nanan Braffitt, also believe that an earlier build-up will make a difference in the performance of the volleyball team. He said that a program has been undertaken to have the players in top condition for the event. As you know, for the last three years, we have been doing well in the, um, in the school games. So this year, what, um, what I'm focusing on is to select a team early and um, to really go into that school games and do well. Because over the years, Trevor, to be honest, we have one of the better teams, but I just know we just cannot win. And I think one of the main reasons is that we don't um, have enough uh, match preparation. But this year, we want to get, um, like when the um, Grenada Volleyball Association having a commission, we'll select a school team to go and participate in that commission. So right now, I'm working on a team for that competition. Volleyball coach Rafael Nanan Baffert. And finally, news of uh, netball wins for down the road strikers, Monk Roach Unstoppables, and Wesley College on Tuesday in the opening matches of the Margaret Dow Knockout Championship in River Road. Down the road strikers got the better of Anakin High School, 31 goals to 14, while Monk Roach Unstoppables defeated Wesley College, 30 goals to 19, in the senior competition. In the junior event, Wesley College beat uh, Monk Roach Unstoppables. 25 goals to 8. The action continues Wednesday with Jet Stars meeting down the road strikers in the junior division, while New Hampshire strikers tackles Vincennes, Mustangs, and the Vendom taking on AGD Tempe in the senior division. That's sports. I'm Trevor Thwaites. Six million girls are born in the Commonwealth, yet far too many don't get the chance to grow into healthy, educated women. Women who can make a positive difference to their own lives and to the lives of others. What if? What if we lived in a world where every mother has access to medical care and her baby has a great chance to be born healthy? What if her baby girl grew up in a safe home with good food, clean water, and access to a health clinic? What if she could attend school where she learns important skills, makes friends, and plays sports? 
What if she stayed on at school gaining the respect of her community and could live with the skills and knowledge to earn her own income? What if she knew about HIV and AIDS and could make a decision about her health and relationships? What if she became a young woman who could have expectations about her life and real opportunities to achieve them? What if her country held elections and she had the right to vote and decide her future? What if she was able to get a loan to start her own business? What if her own business thrived and she was able to offer jobs to others in her community, bringing stability and hope? What if the community chose her to represent them as their leader? What if she could change the lives of other girls? The Commonwealth believes this can happen and is working to give women and girls the opportunity to become the agents of change we all need. Women, agents of change. Welcome back. Thank you, Trevor, with this evening's sports segment. Before we go, here's a recap of the stories making it in the headlines. New law could soon come into force addressing the sale of alcohol to minors. British government's decision on APD described as a small but important victory for the Caribbean. And preserving the jobs of workers remains a major priority for the Trades Union Council. These plus other stories made it in the news. On behalf of the entire team here at the Government Information Service, I am Abigail McIntyre. Thank you for joining us. <music>